Welcome along to Enfield Physics Tutor. Today we're going to take a brief look at the four formulas in the gravitational fields topic. The gravitational field is simply a volume of space around a star where there is the potential for there to be a force provided we have two masses. These field lines show the direction of that force which is towards the centre of mass of the object. Because our object is a sphere, this means that the field is radial in nature. But in order for there to actually be a force, we're going to need a second mass. Say a planet. The force of attraction acts as if it is acting between the two centre of masses as shown and is usually called R, radius. If we allow the bigger mass to be capital M, the star, and the smaller mass to be small m, then we can begin to look at the maths. It turns out that the force is proportional to the two masses multiplied together and is also proportional to 1 over the separation squared or 1 over r squared, an example of the inverse square law. Bringing these two together and adding the universal gravitational constant, we get that force is gmm over r squared. Now, an interesting aside here is that the different A-level syllabuses treat this bit differently. Some of the syllabuses emphasise the negative sign, and some of them just mention it. The negative sign is there because this is an attractive force between the two masses, pulling them together. So we now have a formula that tells us the strength of the force between two masses. But how do we compare the size of the gravitational field of two objects? Well, in order to do that, we have to introduce the idea of gravitational field strength, which is simply the force divided by one of the masses, the small mass normally. Now, this is given the symbol little g, gravitational field strength, which you are, of course, very used to from your GCSE work. And you can see that in order to work out g, we take our force formula and divide it by the small m. When you cancel this through, we just get that the gravitational field strength is gm over r squared. So this is the force on one kilogram from mass m at a distance of r. Now, you'll know g, you've used g a lot over the years, and it is in fact 9.8 newtons per kilogram on the surface of the Earth. And a useful thing to do is to bung in the numbers into this equation for the radius of the Earth, the mass of the Earth, and see if you get 9.81 because you should do. Over the years, it seems to me that one of the problems with this topic is there are several formulas that look the same, lots of G's and M's and R's flying around. So it can be useful to form a grid and look at the pattern between them. So we'll start with Newton's law of gravitation, or G M M over R squared, which is the force between the two objects, obviously measured in Newtons. Now, because this is an attractive force, it should be negative. But as I said previously, different syllabuses treat this differently. So just be aware of that. Now you've come across the idea of an attractive force being negative before when you considered the strong force. Now, the next thing we did was divide our Newton's law of gravitation by the small m in order to get the gravitational field strength, or g, which equals gm over r squared, of course. Now, as I said before, here we've got two Gs flying around, so be careful to know which one is being referred to. The gravitational field strength is the small g, and it's equal to the gravitational constant times the mass of the star, or the big mass, over the radius squared. And this one, will, G will have the units, newtons per kilogram. Sometimes we refer to it as acceleration, which will be meters per second squared, of course, or acceleration due to gravity. Having looked at the forces between two masses, we now turn our attention to thinking about how much energy a mass will have when it's sitting inside a gravitational field. And we're interested to start with thinking about what the energy or potential energy of a one kilogram mass would be sitting in the gravitational field at a distance r from a star capital M. We already have the formulas for the force between two masses and also for the gravitational field strength when one of the masses is set to one kilogram. One thing we are particularly interested in is to know how much extra energy or how much energy we will have to use to take the one kilogram out from one R to a new R. And obviously, we're going to be putting energy in because we're working against a gravitational field. 
One way I like to explain how this works is to imagine an extremely long ladder with many, many rungs all equally spaced on it set up on the earth. We place a one kilogram mass at the bottom of the ladder and move it up one step. And from that point, we can say that it has gained a certain amount of potential energy, EP. Now consider this is just mgh. We used this in lower school because we could say that g didn't change. I'm talking about the gravitational field strength. So for the first three rungs, because they're all really close to planet Earth, gravitational field strength is constant, and therefore moving up between each of those rungs is going to use the same amount of potential energy. However, what happens if we imagine another set of rungs many, many kilometres above the Earth, many thousands of kilometres even? The distance between these rungs is exactly the same as the lower steps, but because G is considerably smaller, the amount of potential energy gained moving up that new rung is really quite small compared to what it was for the lower rungs, far, far down below them. Now consider another set of rungs, which are really, really thousands and millions of kilometres away. In other words, a long, long way from planet Earth. Again, the rungs are the same size between them, and we move our wonderful one kilogram mass up through that same distance. This time, the change of potential energy, or the energy that we need to put into it, is going to be really small. Now, this is showing us that the further we go out, the weaker the gravitational field is and therefore the amount of energy needed to work against that force or to move the mass away from the centre of the Earth becomes increasingly small. The upshot of all this is that the potential energy increases as we move our mass further away from the Earth, but it does so in increasingly small increments. This means that if we could sum up all the potential energy that we have put into the mass it is going to approach or move towards a maximum value of potential energy. Now this will happen way, way out, effectively at infinity. If we sum up all the steps of potential energy that we gained as we went up our infinite ladder, we can approach the value that is given by this formula, gm over r. We call this gravitational potential and it's negative. Please note, it is not gravitational potential energy. The question remains though, is why is this potential energy negative, considering that it's gaining energy? Well, there are two steps to understand this. The first one is that, as we have said several times, we are gaining potential energy as we go up our ladder. It's becoming bigger. This is because we are pushing against an attractive force, so we're having to do work. But that doesn't explain why it's negative. The negative comes from the fact that we need a place where we can say that the potential energy is zero. And by convention, that place is defined as being at infinity. And if it's zero joules at r equals infinity, and it's getting bigger as it approaches infinity, it must be negative. Once again then, returning to our highly informative summary grid, you might have noticed that the top two lines are to do with forces. And the next line is going to be about energy. So first of all, we can take the gravitational field strength, multiply R, and end up with the gravitational potential. As we've seen, is zero at infinity, and is therefore negative because we are going against an attractive force. While gravitational potential is of course very useful, it's also very useful to be able to generalise that formula for any mass small m, for example a satellite orbiting say the moon. So the gravitational potential energy is simply the gravitational potential times the second mass. And that leads us to a formula, GPE is minus GMM over R. And this has the units of joules. Adding gravitational potential to our chart of inspiration is simply a question of multiplying gravitational potential by small m. This gives us GPE equals minus GMM over R, and as we said, measured in joules. 
It's worth giving some time and attention to this table because there are some patterns in it that can prove very useful. So, for example, starting in the top left corner and going clockwise, we can see that to move from Newton's law of gravitation to the gravitational field strength, it's a question of dividing by n. And looking at the bottom row, to go from gravitational potential on the right to gravitational potential energy on the left is the opposite, i.e. multiplying by n. In a similar fashion, to go from gravitational field strength to gravitational potential, multiply by r. And to go from gravitational potential energy to Newton's law, we divide by r. In addition, it's good to point out that the top two entries are to do with force, and the, those entries underneath them, the bottom two entries, are to do with energy. Lastly, you can also fit electric fields into the same boxes, although you have to take a bit more care with the signs because those forces in electric fields, as you know, are attractive and repulsive. <laughs> Thank you.